This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. This episode is sponsored by C-School, the online school for creativity training. If you'd like to unleash your creative potential and access a free creativity blueprint training series, then just head over to c.school. That's www.c.school for your free training series. In today's episode, I speak with Mitchell Resnick, and we talk about creativity in schools, playfulness, and peer creativity. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have on the show Mitchell Resnick. Mitch Resnick, professor of learning research at the MIT Media Lab, develops new technologies and activities to engage children in creative learning experiences. He was centrally involved in the development of the Scratch programming language, the Lego Mindstorms robotic kits, and the Computer Clubhouse network of after-school learning centers. He has been awarded with the McGraw Prize in Education and the AACE Ed Media Pioneer Award. He is also the author of Lifelong Kindergarten, Cultivating Creativity Through Projects, Passion, Peers and Play. And it's my great time having Mitch with us today. So welcome, Mitch. Great. It's great to talk with you, James. So share with everyone what's, what, you, what you're currently working on. What's going on in your world just now? Right now, we just are coming out with our next generation of the Scratch programming language. So Scratch is this programming language and community that we developed to enable kids to create their own interactive stories and games and animations and then share them with one another online. Uh, We first launched Scratch about 10 years ago, and millions of kids around the world are now using it and sharing projects. Uh, So if you go to the Scratch website, you'll see there's like more than 30 million projects that have been created by kids around the world. With this next generation, it'll even expand what kids can create with Scratch. Awesome. And then how did you get involved in this this whole area, obviously, with this, this kind of intersection of creativity and, and technology? I think I've always, you know, wanted to give new opportunities to kids so that they can really live up to their full potential. And I've seen that in the world we live in today, the one thing we can all agree on is that change is coming more rapidly than ever before. And because of that, the ability to think and act creatively is more important than ever. You know, that today's kids are going to be confronted with a never-ending stream of unknown and uncertain and unpredictable situations in their lives. So we can't prepare them by teaching them a specific set of facts, but rather to help them develop as creative thinkers so they're able to come up with innovative approaches to the unexpected situations that they'll, you know, come to, that they'll confront in the future. So I'm always interested to see how can we help kids become creative thinkers so they'll be prepared to thrive in a world where creative thinking is going to be more important than ever before. So what happens, you know, we, we, we see especially younger children, maybe at age four, four, five years old, and you give them some crayons and they're completely immersed in creating. They're in a flow state, you know, a psychologist would say. Um, and then I, then I often go and speak at conferences all around the world. I'm speaking to ad, adults and corporations, and that that glint in their eye when you, about creativity has kind of been lost. So, what happens between the ages, you know, that kind of coming up for fourth grade between there and then when people kind of go out into the world of work? Unfortunately, I do think it's you know that it's the world around the kids sometimes you know deprives them of the opportunity to continue to develop their creative capacities. Because I agree that all kids start with this incredible curiosity to explore the world and to express themselves in the world. In fact, the reason I call my research group the Lifelong Kindergarten Group is because we're so inspired by the way kids have traditionally learned in kindergarten. If you think about the traditional kindergarten, you see kids at a table you know, making pictures with crayons and finger paints. Or in another corner, they might be building houses and castles with wooden blocks. And in the process... They learn a lot. You know, they learn about structure and stability when they build a a tower with blocks. They learn how colors mix together with finger paints. But even more important, they're developing as creative thinkers. They learn about the creative process of how to start with an idea, you know, create something, share it with others, continue to adapt it and refine it. So I think that in early childhood, you know, and, and in kindergarten, we're set up to support kids developing their creativity. Unfortunately, too often after that, 
the kids go into you know school and elementary school and middle school, high school. They spend a lot of time filling out worksheets, listening to lectures, uh, and they learn something from that. But it doesn't really help them continue to develop their you know creative possibilities. Uh, so I think what we're dedicated to do is to say, how can we take that spirit of kindergarten and make it last a lifetime? Because I think if we provide the right support for kids, they'll continue to express themselves creatively and become better and better creative thinkers. I remember seeing a, a statistic or a report that came out from the World Economic Forum, I think it was a few years ago, 2015, and it showed that creativity was going to be, by 2020, was moving from the 10th most important job skill to the third most important job skill. Um, and the reasoning behind that was really that with things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, many of those more routine uh, jobs are going to be going. They're going to be going to machines. It's going to be affect this, this, this new age of AI that, that we're coming into as well. Do you think, you know, because you're, you're in the world of, of academia, but you're going out there working with schools, with, with parents, with businesses as well. Do you think that, that policymakers are fully awake now to, the, to this concept that actually the, the stuff that you, you write about and talk about this idea of creativity and getting creativity right throughout the entire you know, school system and then onto adulthood, do you think they're, they're waking up to that now? They are, but they're just starting to wake up. I don't think they've fully embraced it. So you do see more people recognizing that some change is needed. Like business leaders are recognizing that the, you know, the, the students as they graduate from school aren't really prepared for the needs of today's workforce. So they realize that something different is needed. Uh, so they're, they're ready for change. But change still doesn't come so easily. You know, there's a lot more talk about supporting you know, kids developing creativity, you know, creative thinking and collaborative thinking and critical thinking skills. But I think that we haven't really changed the education system to support those goals. So I do think more people are starting to recognize the need for change, but they haven't really fully embraced exactly how we should change and, and, and what ways, we, what changes we need to make that happen? There was, I was watching. There was a video the other day. Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, um, which I think they use ninety five percent of their customer service now is being done by AI, you know, uh, chatbots, um, machine learning. And he was being asked a question. You know, what would you, your, for your children, and what, how, how can they prepare them for this this new age? And, and he just said. Don't bother competing with the machines. They're going to work faster than you. They're going to be cheaper than you. Don't. That's not. Don't compete with them on those things. And he said, really, what the you need to focus on with, with children, especially, is is really fostering that sense of creativity, um, the the ingenuity, the curiosity as well. And you see that you know, uh, I think it was a Human Plus Machine, a great book that came out recently about AI, Life 3.0, Max Tech Marks. They're all kind of, and these are all the top people in AI. They're all saying creativity is is the thing that we should be training and reskilling people on yet there seems to be this gap at the moment um of people kind of recognizing in that world but there seems to be this gap in terms okay we've got it now but how do we do it what you know what what yeah. do we have to do what what the steps do we need to take not just in in uh in schools but also in in uh kind of in businesses as well today do you have any kind of thoughts on that side well, this reminds me of a, a story from a few years ago. I was invited to visit Singapore and because the government had done some studies and they'd been talking with business leaders and the business leaders were concerned because even though the students in Singapore were scoring near the very top at the international exams and they're very proud of scoring so high on the international exams. But then when they got to the workforce, they knew how to do certain things very well. They could sort of follow the instructions, do things step by step. But as you were saying, that's precisely the type of jobs the machines were taking over. And the students hadn't really developed their creative capacities, which is what the businesses needed. So the government invited me to come over to talk. They were trying to see how should they change education. And I went and visited a school. And because I'd been involved with developing the Lego Mindstorms robotics kits, they took me to a school and introduced me to the National Junior Robotics Champion. And I talked to him and the fellow students. And I saw they were really doing very creative things because this was a case where they were building their robots, programming them. And I suggested different you know, you know, challenges. You know, what would you do if such and such happened? And they came up with very creative solutions. So I was impressed with these kids that they'd been using technology in a creative way to develop as creative thinkers. So I, I, I asked the teacher, I said, you know, I was impressed. I said, I was curious, how did you integrate this into you know, the school day? 
And she looked at me like I was crazy. And she said, we would never do this during the school day. <laughs> during the school day, they must drill on their you know, exercises. This is for after school. So this is a place where the government, the business recognized the need for change. They explicitly were looking to bring in creativity. But you could see the challenge. They were so proud of the high scores from the international exams that they didn't want to make change. There was a real resistance to change. So it was so some of the more creative activities were sneaking in after school. And, and you know, over time, some of these will come into school. But I think it's not easy to bring about those changes. That's fascinating. I mean, those, I mean, you think of someone like Singapore, obviously, it's always at the top of the PISA rankings in, in terms of educational outcomes as well. Um, I remember Edward de Bono, the, the, the writer on, on creativity, many years ago, you being asked, that where, where, where do you see the, the area that's going to have the most opportunity for and really taking on this idea of creativity? And he actually mentioned Singapore. And because it was one of the early places that kind of understood, put lateral thinking, for example, as a, as a technique into its education system. But then having been there, uh, traveled back and forth there as well, and I understand what you mean that there are at certain stages there, there actually there's a lot of very creative things going on. But then at other points, it's kind of quite dogmatic uh, in the system. So for, for any anyone that's watching this just now that maybe has their levers on and governments and policy making and things, where does it start? Does it really start from the education system? That's, that's where you have to kind of get, get those first parts right. Well, I do think it's starting early with kids and continuing both in school and outside of school. Uh, but of course, since kids spend a big chunk of their life in school, school is one important element. But I do think how kids get supported at home and parent with their parents and what outside of school activities are also important. So throughout the whole day, I mean, you know, we talk a lot about lifelong learning these days, which is important. We also have to think about day-long learning, you know, because we want kids learning through the day and having these creative opportunities. Uh, now, it does require some changes to make it happen. We can't just snap our fingers and say, okay, let's focus on creativity, because sometimes the structures that are in place make that difficult. If you only, if a school day is broken up into 50-minute time periods, it's hard to do creative projects in a 50-minute time period. Or if the curriculum is divided up into each week, you move on to a new item. A lot of times it takes longer if you're going to dive deeply and you know, work on a creative project. Or if, this, if the school's broken up into separate units for if science is separate from math, which is separate from social studies, which is separate from language, that also can restrict creative projects because the most creative projects cut across the disciplines. So I think that we need to rethink a lot of the ways that, that schools and other organizations are set up. And I often think of it in terms of breaking down some barriers, break down the barriers between the disciplines, break down the time barriers so kids have longer periods of time, break down the barriers between inside of school and outside of school to have people from the community help out in schools and have school, schools work, have kids work on projects that are meaningful to the community. So I think there are a lot of changes that I think are needed if we really want to support kids continually to develop those creative capacities. I think you are seeing it happen. I, I was speaking to a teacher the other day in Scotland and they're, they're changing their education system. They have a thing that's called a curriculum for excellence. You know, an example there might be, you know, today we're going to be looking at butterflies. And so they'll they'll look at, you know, the, the shape of the butterflies and they'll look at the form of the butterflies and they'll talk about that. And then they'll talk about, okay, how many you know, things on the butterfly's wings and they'll, so mathematics are coming into it. Then they'll talk about, okay, let's write a poem about butterflies and then let's let's do an art art piece about butterflies let's write a story about the butterflies so they're using it it's kind of crossing lots of different areas so that there's there's obviously there's there's signs of hope of optimism there but then when you go into the into the business world and um whenever i ask audiences put your hand up if if you consider yourself to be creative uh, depending on where you are in the world, if it's in America, it's a bit higher, maybe 50%. But in certain parts of the world, it can be as low as maybe 20% that will put their hands up to say they consider themselves creative. So what do we, we do with, with those people, the kind of lifelong learners? How do we get them to really kind of reconnect with that sense of creativity? Well, some of it is trying to keep alive the child inside. And, you know, when we do, you know, workshops with people, you know, here at the visitors to our research lab at, at MIT, we get a lot of business visitors and we sometimes do workshops. It's not so much different than the workshops we do with kids. We try to get them to dive in, you know, to, to, to work on projects, uh, to experiment, to explore, to test the boundaries. So we try to you know, focus a lot on a, a playful approach. And when I say play, 
a lot of times it gets misinterpreted. People think of play as laughing and having fun. When we think of play, we think of it as experimenting, testing the boundaries, trying new things. So I think a creative spirit grows out of this playful attitude uh, where you're constantly willing to take risks and try new things and not being scared off when things go wrong. It's not as people get too scared off when things are wrong. So to really to live up to their creative potential, you have to recognize that when things go wrong, it's an opportunity to you know, to, to go in new directions, to learn new things, as opposed to a, a, a shame and then moving on to some different thing. That is interesting, you know, that sense of, of having that sense of playfulness, because you see that with, you know, Einstein, or, or, or great inventors, great science, people in science and mathematics and other other fields as well. There's, there is a, there's a playfulness to them. They're, they're ch- there's a childlikeness. They're not childish, I guess. is You know, there's, a, there's that kind of real interesting uh kind of area that they cross for which is sometimes even even in, in business sometimes they they have a, almost an issue using the word creativity they'll, they'll talk about more about innovation as, as a as a topic and less about about creativity um there's the, i was reading something the other day gary kasparov was talking about how uh this importance of creativity uh, really kind of coming up because of you know uh, of what's happening with things like ai and and, and machine learning um, and he said, actually, in terms of chess, obviously, he was famously beaten by IBM's uh, uh, AI. But he said, you know, some of the greatest chess players today are centaurs. They're they're a human uh, chess player that's paired with an AI that are working together. And they will be any human chess player or be any AI working on its own. So when you're you're you're, you're working with you know children and, and, and people in, in schools, how are you getting to them to think about that? That combination of of them as, as a human working with a machine and uh, is there is a kind of symbiosis starting to happen? Well, I do think I think technology plays an important role in this new era where creativity is so important. In some ways, technology is is driving the need for change because of the advances in AI and machine learning. It's in some ways necessitating for people to become more creative because, as you mentioned. Machines will take over the more routine tasks and even some non-routine tasks uh, so that people will, you know, sort of need to focus more on the places where humans have a real have something very special. And there's a lot of creative activities are still going to be uniquely human. In some ways, this is a great opportunity because it enables us to work on things that actually can be more human, you know, and that can bring more joy and meaning into our lives. A lot of in the past century, a lot of people ended up doing more machine-like things because there was an economic advantage of people doing things in a machine-like way, working on the assembly line, churning out things. So people got steered to be more machine-like. In some ways, this can be a return of people returning to what makes them most uniquely human. But I think technology can play an important role today, not just in necessitating the change, but in helping support people to become more creative. So I think what we try to do in a lot of our work is seeing how is it that we can use new technology to support people in expressing themselves in new ways. Now, people have always used the material around them to be creative. Some things, like when we talked earlier about children being creative, we talked about drawing with crayons. We have to remember, 100 years ago, crayons were a new technology. So people have always made use of new technologies in order to do new things, whether it's you know, the invention of watercolors and, or crayons or the invention of the telescope and the microscope. You know, These new materials and equipment around us have enabled us to do more creative things. These days, digital technologies can play a really important role of expanding our abilities. But I think what we're always trying to do is not use the technology to just, to just deliver information or deliver instruction. That's the way it's sometimes used in education. And I do think that's not the way to help kids become creative, but rather have the kids see the technology more like a set of crayons. The technology is something they can use to design, create, experiment, and express themselves. So we're always, as we develop technologies, we're always saying, how can we put new tools in the hands of kids to allow them to express themselves creatively in ways they couldn't before? And in your own creative journey, can you tell us about a time maybe you... You were doing something, and and you um you had kind of an aha moment in in the creative uh your creative journey, I guess. You know, you had that kind of insight, or you made some kind of new distinction about what creativity meant to you. One thing, going back to my childhood, one story that comes to mind is, you know, back when I was in fourth grade, 
every Friday, we would take a spelling test. And over the weekend, the teacher would grade it. We would come in Monday morning and we would be told to rearrange our desks based on our scores of the previous week. At the time, I must admit, I really cared about being in the first row. So for a short term, there was a motivation for me because I wanted to do well. But I think ultimately, and this came a few years later, I had the aha moment that this whole approach, clearly, I think a lot of people could say it's not so great for kids who are in the last row, that they feel very discouraged and that they're being almost shamed by where they have to sit. But I think it was not good for people in the first row either. It made us value the wrong things. Because to be honest, getting a high score on the spelling test was not the most important thing, but it was something that was easy to grade numerically and to rank people based on how well they did it. And I came to realize over time that what was most important is to allow every, everybody has their own way in which they can flourish. Um, and that to, that, and so a lot of times those aren't so easy to measure or to rank people by. Somebody's going to be a great musician. Somebody's going to have a certain reasoning ability that's uncanny. Someone's going to be great in their social interactions with people. So to make sure that we allow everybody to follow up on the things they are most passionate about and the, where they have sort of the strongest you know, personal connection to it is going to be the way to help everybody flourish. Uh, so I think that's something that we've always – focused on our work is how can we help every, everybody follow their interests? Because we've seen over and over that when people follow their own interests, they're going to be willing to work longer and harder and make deeper connections to the ideas they, that they engage with when they're doing that. So that's become another of the building blocks of our approach is to make sure that we're not just you know giving kids a same fixed test and then ranking them quantitatively, but rather saying, how can we let kids explore their own paths in many different ways, find, build on their interests to be able to then become more creative on the things that they you know, care most about? But it's interesting that you that story that that happened in the fourth grade for you, because it, that makes it like the fourth grade slump where you traditionally yeah. see creativity levels going kind to of start yeah. to decline in, in, in school, especially in, in the West as well. Um, so in your book, you talk about this creating, uh, cultivating creativity through projects passion peers and play i'm interested on the on the peers part you know we often think you know creativity being quite a maybe indiv individual thing that someone's doing but then when you know when kids go out into the world of work or to go to college university we're having to create things in teams of, of other people so what is you know what do you find in terms of your research and, and the kind of the work that you've done in terms of how that dynamic the creative dynamic when it comes to having a peer group and working with other other people I think oftentimes people are misled by certain images they have of thinking and learning. You know, Rodin's famous sculpture, The Thinker, <laughs> is just someone sitting there alone by themselves in contemplation. So we have that image. That's what serious thought is about. And of course, some thought does happen just sitting there contemplating. But most of our most creative work is not just sitting there by ourselves. It's with interacting with other materials and tools and interacting with other people. So we've always tried, as we develop new activities and new tools for kids, we're always thinking, how can we make sure that kids have a chance to work with, to work with one another, learn with and from one another? It's like with our Scratch programming language, when we launched it at the same, 10 years ago, at the same time that we launched the programming language, we launched an online community. So that as kids created their own stories or games or animations with this programming language, they could share it in the online community and have an audience. And we saw how, how motivating that was that once they created something and other people gave them feedback and suggestions and encouragement, that made a huge difference. And when we did studies, we found that one of the most important determinants of whether someone did a second project was how quickly they got feedback and response to the first project, some social mm -hmm. engagement around their first project really led people to start doing more. So we see that having an audience and getting feedback and suggestions plays a big role in people's learning. And that's one way, but they also get inspiration from seeing what others have done. When you're part of a community, you see what others have done, you get inspiration. And then sometimes you work collaboratively together. You can work together on projects. Uh, one thing that we see on Scratch is that we kept it open so that like, if you created a project and put it on the website, I could not just play with your project. I could look inside, see how you created it, and I could make my own changes to it, my own variations as my own version of it. You would still have your project, 
but I would have what we call a remix of your project. Now, a lot of times when kids first see someone remixing their project, they get upset. They say, they stole my ideas, they stole my work. <laughs> but we talk about it and we say, well, in fact, in Scratch, we feel that everyone should have the right to build on each other's work. Like that's how the scientific community works. Yeah. You know, people put out you know, new ideas and the other people build on those ideas. Now, of course, you should give credit and acknowledgement. So to be a good member of the community, you have to credit when you build on other people's work. But if everybody shares, everybody benefits. And I think we've seen that in the Scratch community, that new ideas spread through the community, that someone comes up with a new animation technique or a new way of you know, scrolling the background in a game. Quickly, other people see it and they start imitating it and improving it. So you see all these refinements and adjustments so we see the whole community can do things that no individual could have done on their own. It also that can expand the sense of what creativity is as well. There was a there was a podcast I was listening to the other day. It was on the the Economist um, magazine, their podcast, and they were interviewing um, one of the the songwriters from uh, ABBA because there's a new ABBA movie out just now. And I mean, there's a classic example. He was just talking about his creative process, and he was just saying. I mean, they took loads of, they're very European. They took loads of things from Beethoven and you can hear all these little phrases that are getting for, so, you know, and, and we think of that, that's clearly kind of creative, the work that the Ava were doing and it was of it, you know, really of its time, but they were kind of remixing to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, you, you could hear what was kind of going on there, but, but I think it was any less creative for it. It was just taking a different take on, take on it and taking a step stage further. When I do think uh, that there's an artist in the United States, Austin Kleon, yeah. who writes about this, about the way that you know artists steal, and he uses the provocative word steal to sort of shake people up, but he's saying that you know everyone does this, so it's nothing is done purely from a blank slate. They were all inspired by what others do, and we take the best of what others have done. And part of what being creative is is developing a good judgment of what you can build on of, of the things out there. What is it that inspires you? What is worthy of being built upon? Uh, so in fact, like in the Scratch community, we want people to feel proud, not upset, if other people build on their work because it means people found it worthy of building upon. <laughs> yeah. So in fact, yeah, we highlight it on the homepage of Scratch. We highlight the projects that were most remixed because you should be proud. This project attracted so much attention that lots of other people are remixing it. Now, we've been talking a little bit about tools. Are, are there any uh, online tools or apps that you find particularly useful for the creative work that you do? Let's see. Well, obviously, we do just in our own work. These are the standard tools. You know, obviously, we can't exist without Google Docs. You know, everything, all of our writing now is collaborative writing. It's hard for me to imagine you know, what it was like not so many years ago when everybody was just writing their own documents and then maybe you know, sending it around and, and the, the ability to collaboratively write documents together, collaboratively put presentations together. So just in our communication, uh, using those collaborative tools is a key to our team. So you know, right now in, in our team as we're developing new technologies, uh, it, it's really important for us to have the right tools where we're sharing ideas and building each other's work. Uh, obviously in the computer programming world, GitHub is now this tool that allows people to share code and build each other's code. And that's sort of a key, it's sort of an indispensable tool for any software development team, you know, these days to be building on each other's work. And with our software, we make it open source. So we also make it available for other people to get access to our code uh, and then to extend it. So a lot of times if they extend it in ways that are interesting to us, we'll then bring it in and, and make a part of, of our software as well. I know you've worked a lot with in the past as well is uh, is Lego. Um, and, th and that's, you know, obviously we think of apps and different, those kind of tools, but that's, the, I think actually that's one of the most powerful kind of creativity tools. You give, give someone Lego, adults or, or children. Um, although I, I think I'm probably more of a fan of like the, 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 the blocks, the, the building blocks ones, as opposed to like the characters where it, it kind of, it feels like it's a preset thing that you have to create but but can you just what, what was the work that you did with with lego then in terms of uh you know the, the technology and the creativity piece so i've worked with the lego company in various collaborations for more than 30 years now and it's been a great collaboration because i do think they're a set of shared values this idea of believing that children will learn best and be happiest when they're given the opportunity to create things and express themselves so of course the classic lego brick is a great material for kids to create things. Um, and I do think it's this combination of structure and freedom, because it does provide some structure. 
because the bricks fit together a particular way, but you can still put them together in so many different combinations and build such a wide variety of things, but it provides you support. And I think the best learning is always the right combination of structure you know, and the freedom to, to do things. I, I, I sometimes say we want to, you know, kids to be able to follow their fantasies, but provide enough structure so they can make their fantasies come to turn to realities. Uh, I also think the traditional Lego brick is a great collaborative tool as well. You know, sitting on a tabletop with lots of Lego bricks, you can you know, picture a bunch of kids around building together and one kid starts building a castle and someone else builds a road with you know, going next to it and someone else you know, builds another part. So there's so many different ways to collaborate when you're sort of working together on building things. Um, and I've always loved one of the slogans they have at the Lego company is joy of building, pride of creation. And I always like that because I do think there's a joy that comes with building, if those guys, especially if it's you know, presented the right way in the right situation. There's a joy that comes from creating things, but also you know a pride of you know a pride of creation. So you can joy in the building, but then pride of creation that when you show it to others and you collaborate with others, there's a pride that comes from it as well. So we see sort of that creating and sharing comes very naturally with Lego materials. So in our work with Lego, we started all the way back actually more than 30 years ago now, in the mid-1980s, and we had the idea of connecting Lego bricks to the computer so kids could build things with Lego, but then program the computer to make their Lego creations come alive. So we worked with them. The first product that came out was all the way back in 1988. So actually, it was that was now was that 30 years ago uh, in 1988, the first computer-controlled Lego that we worked together and we've continued refining that over the years. Uh, and actually, 20 years ago, they came out with Lego Mindstorms, which is like an, a, a, that we worked with them on, where it's a Lego brick with basically a computer packed inside, so you can program it and then put it in your Lego creation, and it will then you know you can tell it what to do. So whereas traditional Lego bricks were great for building structures, but with our new programmable Lego bricks, kids can build things that move and interact and communicate. So it expands the range of things that kids create, uh, but it's still staying true to that same core value of providing kids the opportunity to start with an idea and make it come to life in the world. I think you've inspired me to go and get some Lego bricks and bring them back into the office here as well. Um, what about if there was one book that you would recommend, maybe one book that's inspired you, it could be about on creativity and on the, on the areas that you, you write about as well and you, you research on, what would that book be? I got a lot of my inspiration from another former MIT professor named Seymour Papert, who was the pioneer of technology and learning. And in 1980, he wrote a book called Mindstorms. And for me, that book was hugely influential. And even though it's almost 40 years old now, so some of it you know, will seem a little outdated because like if you write, when he writes about computers, computers were very different in 1980 than they are today. But I think the core message is still the same. Because back then, right as, that was right when computers were starting to spread through society. It was right, the personal computers first started to get out in the late 1970s. So this was right as personal computers were getting out to the world. And when people thought about computers and learning back then, they thought, oh, it'll be great. You have a computer, we'll be able to deliver instruction to kids. And Seymour said, no, that's not the most powerful way of thinking about the new technology. The new technology can enable kids to explore, experiment, to express themselves. So the fact that Seymour saw that the new technologies had, and specifically this new computer technology, had the potential, if it was used in the right way, to open up new creative possibilities for kids was a big, big influence for me and still serves as an inspiration. And if you were to recommend an album, uh, a record, an album, what, what would the album be? I probably, you know, got inspired listening to the Beatles. So uh, if I choose one of the, you know, one of the, the Beatles albums, uh, I'm not sure which one to choose. Are you more a white album person or are you a uh, <laughs> Sergeant Pepper? Actually, when I was, Sergeant Pepper was a special place in my heart. And this is, goes to the, the pure side of things because I remember that album was really popular one summer when I was in summer camp and people were listening to it all the time. And it sort of sparked the creative way of, of thinking of, 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 of within our own group. So I think it was sort of, sort of sparking you know, creativity uh, as I was growing up. And then a final question uh, for you, Mitch. I want you to imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch. So 
I'm going to take you, I'm going to take your position away from you. I'm going to take all your research that you've done in the past away from you. You still have the the knowledge and the skills that you've acquired, but no one knows who you are. You know no one. What would you do? How would you restart things? I think I would build on this idea of peers. That rather than thinking, you know, what can I make on my own, and you know, how can I use the whatever knowledge I have, the, I've always found that my most creative activity has come when I'm surrounded by a group of people that that I enjoy working with and have a set of complementary skills. So the first thing I would do is go out and start seeking the people to work with, because for me that would be the right foundation is to find you know people. And it's not trying to find people who you know are exactly like me. You want people who complement you in very, their various ways, but also people you get along with, you feel you work together with well. So as we build creative teams, I'm always thinking about that. So if I had to start over, uh, the first thing I would do is try to find those right partners for future creative activities. And if people want to learn more about you, your, your work, the work that you're doing at uh, MIT, where's the best place for them to go and, and learn about that? I did come up with a book last year called Lifelong Kindergarten, which is the same as the name of my research group. So if you just go online, you can find the Lifelong Kindergarten book. And in that book, I talk about a lot of my experiences over the years of working with the Lego company, developing the Scratch software and online community. Also some after-school learning centers that we created for you know, in low-income communities and in inner city areas of how we could try to support kids developing as creative thinkers in these centers. So I tell a lot of stories from those activities as a way of providing people with advice of how they can help the young people in their lives develop as creative thinkers and also maybe apply some of it to themselves of how they can keep the creative juices alive inside and how through those, what we call the four P's of creative learning, projects, passion, peers, and play, that they can keep alive their own creativity and support creativity of others. So I think the core message of the book is whenever you can try to you know, engage in projects based on your passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit, and that's how creativity will flow. Wonderful. Great way to, to end this show. Uh, Mitch, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and, and learning about your creative life. And I wish you all the best with all the research and the work that you're doing over there. Great talking to you, James. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.